So now we can proceed on where we had left, uh, left in our last session. And we're evaluating the project evaluation techniques. We looked at the non-discounting techniques, and then we introduced on the discounting technique. So under the discounting techniques, uh, we did the discounted payback period. Then we also did the modified internal rate of return. We also did a question on net present value. So we proceed on net present value. We say that we'll be doing more illustration on net present value. Uh -huh. So we did the one for December 2007. Now let's do another one, May 2014, question 1B. May 2014, question 1B. May 2014, question one bit. And one B, you are told that. Let's start with part A of the question. Part A of the question. That explain four features of an ideal investment appraisal method. Yeah, features yeah, of a, an ideal investment appraisal method. We discussed this one in our last session. Eh? Yeah, so what are some of the characteristics of a good project evaluation technique? And you say that number one, it must take into consideration the time value of money. Also, you see that it should be, it should use cash flows to evaluate. Number three, you say that it should use all the cash flows. It should also give a clear decision on whether to accept or reject a project. Number four, uh, number five, you also say that it should help in also ranking the project. That one, that's what we indicated in our last session. Eh? We discussed that, those are eight marks. Number B of the question. Luanda Limited is considering the launch of a new product M for which an investment of 6 million in planted machinery will be required. The production of M is expected to last for five years after which the planted machinery would be sold for 1.5. Now that's what we call the scrap value. Additional information. M would be sold for 600 shillings per unit with a variable cost of 240 shillings per unit. Fixed production cost, excluding depreciation, would amount to 600,000 per annum. Number three, the company applies straightened method of depreciation. Number four, the cost of capital is 10% per annum. Number five, the number of units of M expected to be produced and sold per annum for the next five years are shown below. So we have year one to year five. Then we have the unit expected to be produced and sold. The corporate tax rate is 30% required. Advise the management of Kiwada Limited on the appropriate cause of action. Number one, using the NPV. Yeah, we are devised using NPV. We say that NPV, <clears throat> Is the present value of cash inflow, you raise the present value of cash outflow. First of all, let's determine the depreciation per annum. How do we get the depreciation per annum? Now, I've been told that in note number three, the company applies certain method of depreciation. So, how do we depreciate this machinery? Uh, well, let's read the paragraph, the first paragraph again. That Kawada Limited is considering the launch of a new product M for which an investment of 6 million in planted machinery would be required. So the cost of the machinery will be 6 million. The production of M is expected to last for five years after which the plant and machinery will be sold for 1.5. So the cost of the machinery will be 6 million, but the asset will not depreciate for it. It will have a salvage value at mm -hmm. the end of year five of 1.5. Now you get the depreciable amount, which is 4.5. Once you get the depreciable amount, you depreciate over a certain method, a uh, straight line eh, for the next five years. Yeah, 45 divided by five, you get? You get 900, correct. 
Ah, yeah. So objective is to get NPV. So to get NPV, I think that you take the present value of cash inflow, you raise the present value of cash outflow. And how do we get that? Let's go to note number one. M limited would be sold for 600 per unit with a variable cost of 240 shillings per unit. So you're given the selling price and the variable cost. Uh, then number five, let's go to number five. Number five, you are told that the number of units of M expected to be produced and sold per annum for the next five years is shown below. So we have year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. So we want to determine the present value of cash inflow. So you'll take the sales and to take the sales, you take the number of units, you multiply by the selling price of which you are given note number one, M would be sold for 600 per unit and the variable cost would be 240. So you multiply by 600. Now, for example, year one, in note number five, you are given the expected number to be produced and sold. It's 8,000 and the selling price per unit is 600. So what do you get? Eight times six you get? You get 4.8. Year two, you will take seven, then you multiply by 600 you get? Uh -huh. Year four, you take 5,000 units at a setting price of 600. That one you get three. And then year five, it's three times six, you get 18. Mm -hmm. Then we raise the variable cost. To get the variable cost, you take the number of units, that's X, then you multiply by the variable cost. Note number one, the variable cost per unit is 240. Short. Yeah, that means, for example, for the first year, you will take 8,000 units, you multiply by 240. What do you get? We have 1920. So year two, you will take seven times 240. Get 1680. 1680. Year four, you take five times uh, 240. You have 1200, and last you take three times 240, get? Get 720, good. Once you raise the variable cost, we also deduct the fixed cost. Note number two, the fixed production cost excluding depreciation would amount to 600,000 per annum. So the fixed cost per annum is 600. Then we also deduct depreciation. And depreciation per annum was an amount of 900. Now, listen here. Now, depreciation, it's not an actual outflow, it's just a provision. Depreciation is only provided for tax purposes. Yeah, remember I said that in these discounting techniques, we are using cash flow, not accounting profit. And you think that depreciation is not an actual outflow. So therefore it's not part of the cash flow. It's only provided for tax purposes. We are only deducting it for tax purposes. So now let's get the earnings before the tax. We get earnings before tax. We have the 1080, the first one. We have 1020. 1020. We have 300. And a deep point good. Then we deduct the tax. And the last note we are told that the corporate tax rate is 30%. So Take that percent. Uh huh. One that is times three, you get so four. Four fourteen. This one you get three or six. You get three or six. You get ninety, right? And uh -huh. the last one. This one. Which one? The last one. You are getting. Yeah. 
6900 i think it's correct the way it is eh? negative 420 if you take 1800 minus 720 minus 600 minus 900 yes that is for is it for 20 or 40 it's okay eh? so that is zero we don't tax cross then we get the earnings after tax. So give me the earnings after tax. Nine sixty. Nine sixty six. Sorry. Seven fourteen. Seven fourteen. Now, once you get the earnings after tax, now here we are not working with the accounting profit. We are working with the cash flows. Now, once you get the earnings after tax, you add back depreciation. We see that depreciation is only provided for tax purposes. It's not an actual outflow. We're only deducting it for tax purposes. Then we add it back. So we add back depreciation, which was 900 per year. And that's how we get now our cash flows. So we get 1866, 1614, 1614, 1110, you get 408. Good. Yeah, that's now the cash flows for Italy. Then remember at the end of the year, we are told that this machine will not depreciate fully. At the end, we are going to sell this machine at 1.5 million. That's at the end of the economic life. So we also add the salvage value. But the salvage value will only dispose at the end of year five at 1.5. That's how we get now our net cash flows. This one you get 19.8. Now, once we have the net cash flow, our objective is to get the present value of cash flow. So to get the present value of cash flow, you discount the cash flow. Present value interest factor. This one is not an annuity since the cash flow are not the same. If the cash flow are not the same, we use the past table. If the cash flow are the same, that's when you use the second table, the annuity table. So 10% period N. So we go to the discounting table. The first one you get is 0.9091. 8264, 7530. You get 6830. Get 6209. Good. And that's how you get now the present value. Now give me the present values. Sorry? 1696. Huh? Yeah. Wait. Point three. Let's just round off. Thirteen thirty-four. Ten twelve. Yes, you round off. Twelve thirteen. Ninety two, ninety two or nine twenty, because this is eleven ten, not one ten. Twelve twenty nine. Have seven fifty eight. Good. So now let's add the total present value so that we get the present value of cash inflows. So add the total present value from year one to year five. Sixty-two. Yeah. That. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. So the present value of cash inflow is twenty uh, sixty-two thirty. Now objective was to evaluate using NPV. So which is present value of cash inflow? You raise the present value of cash outflow. We have the inflow, you raise the present value of cash at home. Now, to undertake this project, you are buying the machine. And the cost you're incurring to buy that machine is the present value of cash outflow 
Was it 6 million? Yeah. yeah, the cost of the machine was 6 million. So that means the net present value will be to that, which is positive. Now the question was, advise the management of Kiwada Limited on the appropriate cause of action using number one was NPV. So now, should we and accept the project or reject the project? We accept or reject the project? We accept the project. Accept the project since the NPV is positive. I gave you the decision criteria. So for NPV, you take when the project has a positive NPV. Now you can copy.
Now let's look at something else. Still an NPV look at project evaluation, project evaluation incorporating working capital changes. Project evaluation, project evaluation. Incorporating working capital changes, incorporating the working capital changes. Project evaluation, incorporating working capital changes. Incorporating the working capital changes. Where right, do you say that? Working capital, working capital, working capital is current assets minus current liability. Working capital is the current assets minus current liabilities. Also, then I have to say that working capital, working capital, working capital is an outflow. Working capital is an outflow. Working capital is an outflow at the beginning of the economic life. Working capital is an outflow. Working capital is an outflow at the beginning of the economic life and an inflow at the end of the economic life. And an inflow and an inflow at the end of the economic life. And an inflow at the end of the economic life. Good, yeah. We are saying that working capital is the current asset minus current liability. Now, working capital is an outflow at the beginning and then becomes an inflow at the end of the economic life. Now, let's do an illustration. 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 Let me see that. Baraka Limited, Baraka Limited is considering investing in a new processing machine. Baraka Limited is considering investing in a new processing machine. In a new processing machine costing 25 million Kenyan shillings. Costing 25 million costing 25 million Kenyan shillings. Costing 25 million Kenyan shillings, full stop. The machine would be used for five years. The machine would be used for five years. The machine would be used for five years. And then disposed, and then disposed, and then disposed for five million Kenyan shillings, and then disposed for 5 million Kenyan shillings at the end of the fifth year, 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 for some additional information, additional information, number one, additional information, number one, additional raw material, amounting to 5 million additional raw material, additional raw material amounting to 5 million shilling would be required at the beginning of the five year period. Additional raw material amounting to 5 million shillings would be required, would be required at the beginning of the five year period. Be required at the beginning of the five year period. For the stock. This would increase the account payable. And this would increase the account payable. This would increase the account payable by 2 million. This would increase the account payable by 2 million. For the, stock. the changes in working capital would reverse the changes in working capital would reverse at the end of the fifth year. Would reverse at the end of the fifth year. I would reverse at the end of the fifth year. Full stop. Number two, additional information number two. The new machine, the new machine, the new machine would increase 
the new machine would increase the company's gross profit. The new machine would increase the company's annual gross profit. Yeah, the new machine would increase the company's annual gross profit from 12 million to 24 million. From 12 million to 24 million from 12 million to 24 million, full stop. Then number three, increment of fixed cost, increment of fixed cost, increment of fixed cost would amount to 2.2 .2 million per annum. Incremental fixed cost would amount, incremental fixed cost would amount to 2.2 .2 million per annum. Number four, number four, Additional machine operator, additional machine operator, additional machine operator would be employed at a cost of 1.6 million per annum. Additional machine operator would be employed at a cost, would be employed at a cost of 1.6 million per annum. Number five. The new machine would be depreciated on a certain basis. The new machine would be depreciated on a certain basis. Lastly, number six, tax rate is 30%. Tax rate is 30%. Tax rate is 30%. And cost of capital is 12%. And cost of capital and cost of capital is 12%. And cost of capital is 12%. Required, required, required. Using NPV, using NPV, using NPV, comma. Advise the company, advise the company on whether to invest in new machine. Advise the company on whether to invest in new machine. Advise the company on whether to invest in new machine. Good. Just read that question again. Read that question again. Good. So now let's solve that question. So we have to evaluate that project using NPV to determine whether it's viable to undertake or not. Eh? So we know very that NPV is the present value of cash inflow divided the present value of cash outflow. So first of all, let's determine the present value of cash outflow. Now for the present value of cash outflow, we have the cost of the machine. How much would be the cost of the machine? we have is 25 million. Then you add the working capital changes. Yeah, we say that working capital is an outflow at the beginning and then becomes an inflow at the end. 
And they are told that number one, that additional raw material amounting to 5 million would be required at the beginning of the five year period. The raw material is part of current assets, part of the inventory. This would increase account payable by 2 million. So working capital is current asset minus current liability. Stock will increase by five, but payables will increase by two. So that means the working capital will be an amount of three. So that means the present value of cash outflow we need is 28. Good. Then another thing we need, we need to determine the depreciation. Eh? Yeah, that's note number five. Note number five that the new machine would be depreciated on a certain basis. So we determine the depreciation per annum. So depreciation per annum will take the cost of the machine, which is 25 million, but this machine will not depreciate fully. It will have a salvage value of how much? Five million. So you get the depreciable amount, and then you depreciate over the economic period of five years. So 20 divided by five, you get? Good. So now let's get the present value of cash inflow. So I'll determine the present value of cash inflow. Note number two, I told that the new machine would increase the company's annual gross profit from 12 to 24 annual. So you have the incremental gross profit. Incremental gross profit from 12 to 24. So that means we increase, so it's 24 minus 12, you get 12 million. Then you raise, then you raise. Number three, the increment of fixed cost would amount to 2.2 million per annum. So there is increment of fixed cost and fixed cost will increase by 2.2 million. Also, note number four, additional machine operator would be employed at a cost of 1.6 million. So, Operator cost, it will cost 1.6 million. And that's I get the earning before depreciation and tax. Now give me the earning before depreciation and tax. Correct? Okay. 8.2. Then you raise depreciation, and depreciation was an amount of four. And that's how we get now the earnings before tax, which would be 4.2. Then you raise tax at the rate of 30%. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah, the tax rate is 1.26. Now we get the earnings after tax. Two point nine four. Then you add back depreciation, which is an amount of four, and that's how we get our annual cash flows, an amount of six point nine. Or alternatively, alternatively, and this is the easier method. Eh? You take the increment of gross profit, which is twelve. You raise the fixed cost of 2.2. You raise the operator cost, operator cost of 1.6. Now what you get here will be earning before tax, 8.2. Now instead of being earning before depression and tax, make it the earnings before tax. Then you raise the tax directly at that percent. Now give me that percent of that. Two point two point four six. Then we get earnings after tax. Five point seven four. Now, once you get the earnings after tax, we add depreciation tax shield benefits. You see that depreciation is not an outflow. That's why we are deducting and then adding it back because it's not an actual outflow. Now, you tax directly, you get the earnings after tax. Then you add depreciation tax shield benefit. You take thirty percent of the depreciation per annum, which is four. And you get one point, and that's how you get now your annual cash flows. How much is the annual cash flows? 
6.94. And this is the easier method. Eh? In most of the scenarios, this is what I like using. I'll be using this eh? instead of deducting and then adding it back. Good. So this is our annual cash flow. Now, once we get the annual cash flows, we need to get the present value. So you discount present value interest factor of an annuity. Now, this is an annuity. Remember, this was the incremental gross profit per annum. This was the fixed cost per annum. So it's an annuity for the next five years. How much was the cost of capital? 12% and the project is for five years. So three point, we use the second table, it's an annuity. Point, good. And that's how we get the present value of annuity. Now give me the present value of an annuity. You take the annual cash flow, you multiply by 3.6048. Like that, eh? So 25. Then we also have what you call the terminal benefits. We have another inflow, but the terminal benefit will only happen at the end of the economic life. Now, remember, this asset will not depreciate fully. It will have a salvage value of 5 million at the end of the economic life. So the salvage value, that's at the end of the economic life. That's at the end of year five, an amount of five. Then you add the working capital. Remember, you say that working capital is an outflow at the beginning and then becomes an inflow at the end. And the working capital changes was an amount of three. So that means at the end, we expect a terminal benefit of eight. Then we discount this eight. Present value interest factor. Now, this one is not an annuity. The terminal benefit will only happen once at the end of year five. So we use the first table. Present value interest factor, 12% at the end of year five. You get zero point? 12% at the end of year five? Sorry? Five, six, seven, four. Now let's get the present value. You take eight times the discounting factor. Four point? So therefore, to get the present value of cash inflow, we had this, the present value of an annuity, which is 25. Then we have the present value of the terminal benefit, 4.5392, and you will get 29.5392. So to get NPV, it's the present value of cash inflow, you raise the present value of cash outflow. How much is the present value of cash outflow? It's here. This is what you compare the present value of cash outflow, which is an amount of 20? 28. And the net present value will be 1.539. So do you accept or reject the project? You accept the project. Can copy now.
Advantages of NPV. Advantages of NPV. Number one, number one. It takes into account, it takes into account time value of money. It takes into account time value of money. <laughs> takes into account the time value of money. Number two, number two, it gives a clear decision on whether to accept or reject a project. It gives a clear decision on whether to accept or reject a project. Number three, it uses cash flows to evaluate a project uses cash flows to evaluate the project. Another one, it uses all cash flows. It uses, which one? Number three was it uses cash flows to evaluate a project. Number three was it uses cash flows to evaluate a project. And then number four, it uses all cash flows. It uses all the cash flows. It uses or the cash flows. And then another one. It is consistent. It is consistent with the shareholder's goal. It is consistent with the shareholder's goal of wealth maximization. It's consistent with the shareholder's goal of wealth maximization. Wealth maximization. Good. Disadvantages, disadvantages, disadvantages. Number one, cash flows used in evaluation of the project, cash flows used in the evaluation of the project, cash flows used in the evaluation of the project are usually estimates, are usually estimates, are usually estimates. Number two, it assumes, it assumes the cost of capital will remain constant. It assumes the cost of capital, it assumes the cost of capital will remain constant over the evaluation period. It assumes that the cost of capital will remain constant over the evaluation period, which is not always the case, which is not always the case. not always the case. Another disadvantage, sometimes, 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 NPV might give, sometimes NPV might give, NPV might give conflicting results, might give conflicting results with IRR, might give conflicting results with IRR, with IRR. Now let's look at the fourth method of the discounting technique. That's the profitability index. Profitability index. Let me say that. This is the relative measure of performance. This is the relative measure of performance. This is the relative measure of performance, full stop. It indicates, it indicates, it indicates the returns ratio, it indicates the returns ratio, the returns ratio for every amount invested, for every amount, for every amount invested, uh, invested, for every amount invested, full stop. It's evaluated as follows, it's evaluated as follows, it's evaluated as follows. Uh, so to get the profitability index, you take the present value of cash inflow, you divide by the present value of cash outflow. 
show that formula. That profitability index is the present value of cash inflow. You divide by the present value of cash outflow. So then we have to see that. Profitability index, profitability index is mostly applicable. Profitability index is mostly applicable. In evaluating the projects, it's mostly applicable in evaluating the projects when the company is facing capital rationing, when the company is facing capital rationing, when the company is facing capital rationing, company is facing capital rationing. Full stop, explain and say that. Capital rationing, capital rationing, capital rationing is the scarcity of investment fund. Capital rationing is the scarcity of investment fund, is the scarcity of investment fund to undertake all viable, to undertake all viable independent projects, to undertake all viable independent project to undertake all viable independent project. Yeah, now let's look at decision criteria. Decision criteria number one. If the profitability index is greater than one, that's when you accept the project. But if the profitability index is less than one, you reject the project. But if the profitability index is equals to one, that's what we call the point of indifference. Yeah, that means you can either accept or reject the project. Now let's look at types of capital rationing, types of capital rationing. Type of capital rationing. Number one, we have soft stroke internally generated, internally generated capital Rationing. Number two, we have hard or externally generated capital rationing. Remember, I have said that the capital rationing, this is where the company is facing some capital uh, constraints eh? to undertake all viable uh, projects. Now, assuming that we have three, four projects, project A, B, C, and D. Project A requires a capital of 30 million. Project B requires 40. Project C requires 10. And project D requires 20. So that means the total capital is 100 million. But now in this case, assume that these projects are independent. That means they don't, uh, do not conflict with each other. And all of them, they are serving different purposes. Then assume that all these projects, if undertaken, they yield a positive NPV. That means that these projects are viable. So that means if you have 100 million, undertake all of them. But you find that in this case, the company has only 70 million. So that means there is scarcity of 30 million. Now this is what now we call the capital ratio. Now in this case, how does the company now decide which project to undertake? 
You see, if these projects were mutually exclusive, you could have selected the one with the highest NP, NPV. But in this case, you cannot use NPV to rank that. Why? Because these projects are independent. If they're independent, they are serving different purposes. And if they are serving different purposes, also the size of the project are not the same. Because 40 million and 10 million, that means project B is bigger than project C. So you cannot use NPV. Now, this is where now we factor in the profitability index. Yeah. Okay, this is what I mean. Assuming that project B, it will yield a profit of 10 million, and C will yield a profit of 8 million. Okay, in layman's language, if you are to use NPV, which one are you going to take? B or C? B, right? Because that's high NPV. But for you to generate 10 million, how much are you investing? 40. For you to get a profit of 8 million, how much are you investing? Are you getting? So the ratio. So that means this one, you're only investing 10 to get 8. This one, you're investing four times only to get 10. So in that case, you cannot use NPV. So that's when now we use the profitability index where you'll be taking the inflow over the outflow. For example, in this case, for you to get a profit of 10, how much was the inflow? 40, correct. Huh? For you to get a profit of 10, how much was the inflow? 50. <laughs> NPV is the present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow. So that's the case. If the NPV is 10, now the question is how much was this inflow? Present value of cash outflow was 40. So that means for you to get a profit of 10, the total present value of cash inflow is an amount of 50. So that means in that case, if you have to determine the profitability index, you will take the present value of cash inflow, which is 50, you divide by the present value of cash outflow, which was 40. For C, it's 10 plus 8, it's 18. That's the present value of cash inflow minus uh, divided by the present value of cash outflow. This is 1.8. What about this? 50 divided by 4, you get 1.25. Now, in terms of profitability index, which one has the highest profitability index? Yes, 1.8. Ah, so now let's start with the first one. Soft. Capital rationing, soft capital rationing, soft capital rationing. Let me see that. This is the scarcity of investment fund. This is the scarcity of the investment fund. This is the scarcity of investment fund due to management actions due to management action due to management action due to management action ie ie the scarcity the scarcity the scarcity is due to factors within the scarcity is due to the factors within the control of the management scarcity is due to factors within the control of the management Full stop. It may arise due to the following circumstances. It may arise due to the following circumstances. It may arise due to the following circumstances. Yeah, what might lead to soft capital rationing? Number one, number one, number one. When the management refuses to issue new shares to raise capital, when the management refuses to issue, when the management refuses to issue new shares raise capital so as to avoid dilution of ownership so as to avoid so as to avoid dilution so as to avoid dilution of ownership so as to avoid dilution of ownership yeah remember you're saying that capital is running you're saying that assuming that the project needed a hundred million but the company has only 70 million so that means there is scarcity of that million. Now we are saying that in soft or internally generated capital rationing, this is the scarcity due to factors within the control of the management. Now in this case, assuming that the company is a public company, they can issue new shares to get that million. But in this case, the management they are fearing. 
if we issue new shares, so what will happen? We'll have new subscribers, right? New subscribers, what will happen to the ownership? In short, you have other owners. Because if you buy the share, become the owner of the company. So in that case, the management will be afraid of that. Eh? Number two, number two, when the management, when the management refuses to borrow more funds, when the management refuses to borrow more funds to avoid the payment of interest, to avoid the payment of interest, to avoid the payment of interest, to avoid the payment of interest and financial risk and financial risk and financial risk. Yeah, that means in this case, the company can borrow. Yeah. They can borrow an addition of that million. But now in this case, they are peering. If we borrow that million, that means we'll have to pay the interest. Interest is an expense. If we increase our expenses, our profit will reduce automatically. So in that case, they just face capital ratio. Number three, number three, number three. When the management has set a limit, when the management has set a limit, when the management has set a limit, of capital budgeting, budget of capital budgeting, budget of capital budgeting, budget. I remember you said that capital budgeting, they are long term projects. Eh? Now, assuming that at the beginning of the year, the company had came up with a budget, you have to plan in advance. And the company had made a budget of 70 million. But the company has money, eh? so they can even afford a hundred million. But in this case, eh, you go back to the finance manager, you request that. Now, after evaluation, all the viable projects require a hundred million. So you're facing a shortage of that. Finance manager, Namwambia, no, now stick to the budget. How much was the budget? 70, stick to that budget. This one does not mean that the company does not have, does not have money. They have money, but you still hold to what uh, the original plan. You stick to the budget. Yeah, that's uh, what we call it's part of the soft or internally generated calculation. Another one, another one, where the capital budget, uh, budgeting project, where the capital budgeting project, where the capital budgeting project, where the capital budgeting project can only be undertaken, can only be undertaken, can only be undertaken using internally generated funds, using internally, using internally generated funds using internally generated funds using internally generated funds number two number two we look at hard yes sorry project we can be internally sorry an example of a project we can no, it's not a project. When you talk about when the project can only be uh, uh, funded internally, when the company have provided that for we to undertake any long-term project, the funds must be generated internally. That's the retainer. And it's not about the project. It's all about for us to fund any project, the money must come within. And for us to come within, that means you must only use the retained pro, retain profit. That means you cannot borrow. That one is provided in the capital cross of the company. So, so. Yeah, yeah, we have some companies, but they cannot borrow to undertake any long term project. Mm -hmm. All they can do, not only they use the internally generated funds, and that's the retained profits. Good. Number two, hard stroke externally generated capital rationing. Yeah, that was soft. Now we look at hard capital rationing. Hard stroke externally generated capital rationing. Right, we that. This is the scarcity of investment fund. This is the scarcity of investment funds. This is the scarcity of investment funds. Due to factors beyond the management control. Due to factors beyond the management control. Due to factors beyond the management control. Also, in bracket, in bracket, external factors, external factors, external factors. Also, 
it may arise due to the following circumstances. It may arise due to the following circumstances. It may arise due to the following circumstances. <clears throat> yeah, we are saying that for this external, this is where the management, they are willing hmm, to get this 30. But now they cannot be able to get because of some factors which are beyond their control. Number one, when the capital market is depressed, when the capital market, when the capital market is depressed, when the capital market is depressed, making it difficult, making it difficult, making it difficult, trace finances, making it difficult, trace finances, making it difficult, trace finances. Number two, number two. High demand of investment funds, high demand of investment funds by well-established company, high demand of investment funds, high demand of investment funds by well-established companies, by well-established companies. Another one, another one. Lack of collateral stroke security, lack of collateral stroke security, lack of collateral stroke security when borrowing. Yeah, lack of collateral stroke security when borrowing. Another one, another one. High cost of borrowing, high cost of borrowing, high cost of borrowing, high cost of borrowing. Good. Now you can do an illustration. May 2012, question 4B. May 2012, question 4B. They are told that ABC Limited has the following proposed independent project for the year and that part of December 2012. So we have project A to E. We have the cash outages. Then we have the present value of the future net cash flows required. Assuming there is no capital rationing, indicate which project to select. Now, assuming there is no capital uh, rationing, you determine which project should we accept. Now, note that you should only accept the project if the project is viable. And how do you measure viability? When the NPV is what? Positive. Eh? Yeah, you only accept when the NPV is positive. And NPV is the present value of cash inflow you raise the present value of cash outflow. So we have project A, B, C, D, and E. So you take the present value of cash inflow and you are given the present value of the future net cash flow. We have a thousand, we have 25, we have 300, we have 400, we have 300. Then you raise the present value of cash outflow. Yeah, that's the initial outlay. Project A, it's 500. We have it 1,000. We have four. We have three. And then we have, this is two, sorry. And that's how we get our NPV. So this is 500. We have 1,500. We have negative 100, 100, 100. So you have to advise which project you want to take. You want to take the project which the NPV is positive. So you undertake, you undertake, you reject. You undertake, you undertake. So therefore, you should undertake A, B, D, and E. 
And number two, number two. The total NPV of the selected project, total NPV of the accepted project. So it's 500, you add 1500, you add 100, you add 100, and that's 2200. Number three, assuming a single period internal capital constraints of 1.7 is imposed, indicate which project should be selected. Now, assuming that the maximum we can uh, we have to invest, it's only 1.7, which project should we uh, undertake? Now, whenever there is capital rationing, whenever you see capital rationing, that's when you use the profitability index. And profitability index is the present value of cash inflow to divide by the present value of cash outflow. So we have project A, project B, Project D, project E. You don't factor in C. C has already failed the test. Now, project A, you take the present value of cash inflow, which is 1,000. You divide by the present value of cash outflow, which is 500. Project B will be 25. You divide by 1,000. Project D, it's 400. You divide by 300. E is 300. You divide by 200. This is, uh, this is two, right? The first one is two. We have 2.5. Four over three, 1.3, and you have 1. 1.5. Now let's rank those projects in the priority to the profitability index. Which one has the highest profitability index? B number one, number two, Number three and then number four. So you do now the capital allocation. So the available capital, we are told that the company has only 1.7. So how do you allocate that? So you give the first priority to the project with the highest profitability index, that's project B. And project B. Project B requires a capital of how much? How much is the capital for project B? Hey, Angaria Niapo, out here, Ningapi. So you minus 1,000. So the balance we have is 700. Then you want to take the project rank number two, that's project A. Project A required a capital of 500, so you have a balance of 200. And then we still have some cash. So you want to take the next. Project number three, we have project A, which requires a capital of two. So therefore, you should undertake project B. A and A. Good. You can copy. And we can call it a day. So in our next session, we'll proceed with, we shall do another illustration on profitability index. And then we finish up on the last method, which is the internal rate of return.